You know, as, as we, we come here and we walk into this building, um, believing it to be safe, enjoying the, the freedoms that we have here um, in this nation that is still um, a great, great place to live, we can't help but notice the tension all around. We can't help but notice that terrorism is on the rise all over the world. Um, not just with the mainstream media shows, but if, if one of you were to do a Google search on um, recent terrorist attacks, um, you'll see there's hundreds every month that go unreported. Um, the world is becoming a scarier, scarier place. As we, as we look around, a lot of people, ourselves included at times, have to admit that there is a brewing tension everywhere everywhere in the world. And what, what comes out of that is feelings of fear, feelings of anxiety. People react out of that fear, whether it be in anger or depression or whatever. All of this is clearly on the rise. We can't help but notice the world and our nation have changed. In the process, what the world is asking and what even as Christians we find ourselves oftentimes asking is where is God and where are his people? Where is God and where are his people? Now being God's people gathered together in this room, knowing him personally, knowing what he's called us to and what he saved us from, it makes us just want to scream to the world and at our televisions and to everyone that we see, hey, we're here. We're here, so's God, he hasn't left, he still loves you. But it's very easy to feel like we're outnumbered. In fact, it's easy to feel like we're outnumbered because the truth is, we are outnumbered. We are an extreme minority in the world today. And I'm not talking about if you were to Google how many Christians are there in the world today, right? Just because somebody checked it off on a piece of paper does not make them God's people, Amen. right? It's more than just a title, but it is, it is a group of people that have been saved from our sins, saved from, from the wrath of Almighty God, set apart for Him. And as we feel outnumbered, and it creates feelings in us of vulnerability, it creates feelings in us of, of fear that maybe we can't rise to the task when we're outnumbered. And, and we see it as a bad thing. We see it as something that we even pray, God, how, please send more. Send more troops. Send more. Lord, we need more people to do, to do your work. God, we're outnumbered. Today, I want to talk about the idea of being outnumbered and let's see, let's see if God feels the same way we do about us being such a minority. You see, this isn't the first time in the world's history that climates like the world that we live in right now have existed. See, God's people have always been outnumbered. We see a very similar situation taking place in Israel during the time directly following the death of Joshua. Right? This, is, this is a time period known as the time of the judges. It was a period in Israel's history where they no longer had Moses or Joshua to lead them, but they had not yet um, established Saul as their first king. So it was a time where Israel was significantly outnumbered by its enemies. And we see during this period uh, a group of people who were left without, without a leader, who should have kept their eyes focused on God. Instead, here's what we see in the very first verse of Judges 6. It opens with, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord God gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. God's people, God's outnumbered people, took it upon themselves to reject that tension, to reject what God had called them to do and called them to be, and had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so what the Lord had done was he removed his hand of, 
of protection over them. He allowed the consequences of their decisions to happen. God wasn't punishing them. God wasn't torturing them, right? But what he did was he, he allowed them to have what they wanted. He allowed the consequence. And as we as a nation have thrown God out of our schools, we've thrown him out of every establishment here, and then we throw our fists at him for allowing the things to happen to us that happen. We see that the Midianites are terrorizing the Israelites and have created an environment of such fear that they literally abandoned their homes and made homes in the mountainsides and deep in, in places that they couldn't, couldn't be found. And every time that the Israelites would plant crops or, or look to reestablish um, some sort of ecosystem, the Midianites would just storm in and, and destroy it. They were living in fear of the very real terrorism that was taking place in their midst. And while they were in fear and hiding, they were barely able to survive. Forget thrive, they could barely survive. They were in hiding. They were afraid. They could barely scrounge enough food to get by. And as the economic system continued to get worse, their biggest problem, so they thought, were, we're hungry. We don't have a stable place to live. We can be killed, right? They're in hiding. There's fear and terror. And meanwhile, the worst part of it wasn't even any of those things. The worst part is they were completely off mission. The worst part is they were God's chosen people. They were, they were set apart to be the people that represented God to the people around them. They were the missionaries. They were supposed to be the ones going to these other nations, leading such an example in how they lived and how they acted towards one another that the example would overflow to the nations around them so they could tell them about the grace and the mercies of Jehovah God and who God really was. And it's really tough to do that when you're hiding in a mountain. It's really tough to do that when, when, when your biggest worry is where am I going to get my next meal and running in fear. So after years of turmoil and terrorism, we see the Israelites come to a point where they get it and they cry out to God, deliver us. Please, God, we're sorry. Deliver us. We pick up in verse 11 in Judges 6. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has this all happened to us? And where are all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us, and he's given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Israel cries out to God for a deliverer, and God looks over Israel and goes, oh, there's the wimpiest, puniest, terrified punk of a kid who's so scared that he's hiding in a wine press to, to, to beat grain. <laughs> and, then, and then we see the angel of the Lord, and AKA, as you'll see here, he then addresses him as Lord, and we see this is, this is what's called a Christophany, right? Jesus didn't first show up in Bethlehem. This is Jesus talking to Gideon. And what, what Jesus says to Gideon, to this puny, little, terrified, punk, scared kid, rise mighty man of valor. Was Jesus being sarcastic? No. 
Let me just give you a little segue before we move on. I got to tell you, and this is so powerful. God never sees you as the puny, punk, sinful, evil, wicked, selfish, afraid, weak, frail, self-centered, narcissistic, egotistical, crazy, screwed up in the head, probably needs more medication than you're taking, type of person that you really are. What he sees is what he can do in you and through you. That is what he sees. He's not limited by time. When he found me, I was a wreck. Hey, I'm still a train wreck, but I'm doing a little better only because of him. That's it. And he sees that and he knows that and he moves forward with us in that. There's no reason to hang our heads in shame knowing that God sees us that way and that he can change us and make us into that person that he speaks over our life that we are. Now, there's a lot that we can talk about in this passage. The truth is many of preachers have talked about Gideon, and they've, you know, there's 25 different sermons at least that I've heard just on, on this passage. But I find something very interesting in this story that I want to highlight as we make our way to verse 25. In 25, it says, That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, Pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that's beside it. Now, if, if you read the whole story, it's kind of like the story is building, and this is just a little aside, right? It's not a pause, it's not a whole portion, it's not a whole story. It's just a little aside that as God is talking to Gideon, he's like, by the way, um, you should also go in your backyard and take down your idols. I love that. I love how, how it says it like that because after reading this verse, I go back to the interaction between Jesus and Gideon and I can answer Gideon's question from his encounter with Jesus. He says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And then the Lord says to him, go in your yard and pull down the altars of Baal and Asherah. Well, of course terror is consuming your life. You invited them into your backyard. <laughs> we, we, we have this mindset that they had. Israel had it, right? Let's, let's pick on Gideon. Gideon, no idols. Where were you when you got the law? Don't you know? Didn't you read your Bible growing up? Come on, buddy. And then we don't even, we don't even recognize the fact. Each and every one of us, myself included, who drove here today have idols in our backyards too. We have idols, folks. We do. And I can tell you this, I can tell you if we as a people, as God's chosen people, would get rid of the idols from our own backyards, we might see a mighty work of God in this nation like hasn't happened in a long time. Amen. Maybe, just maybe, if we would cast down our idols and then stop shaking our fists at God when he doesn't meet what we see as our need, which is oftentimes really just a want, but we want to worship him and worship stuff. And then we invite the demon gods, that's what idols are, right into our own backyard. It is time for us to step up ourselves. It's time for us to step up for our families, for our church, for our nation, and ultimately for God's glory. We need to tear down our idols. Now, if you're sitting here and you're like, all right, cool, he's yelling at me for having an idol, and I would love to be like, yeah, I'm going home and tearing down my idol. What is it? Maybe I don't have any. Vinny's just in a bad mood. No, listen, listen, I'll, 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 let, me, let me help you out. If you could answer this question, you have an idol. You ready? What am I doing or not doing that prevents the people around me from wanting to know Jesus simply because I know him? I'll say it again. It's okay. You could say, ouch. You can beat me up after the sermon. I had to beat myself up with this too, right? I get to preach to me before I preach to you. I'm hurting too, okay? <laughs> but the, here's a question. Write it down, record it, whatever. This is a question we need to continually ask ourselves. What am I doing or not doing that prevents the people around me from wanting to know Jesus simply because I am? know him. That thing you are doing or not doing is very much an idol in your life because it is getting in the way 
of the mission God has placed you on, to know God more and to make him known to the nations, which that sounds great to the nations. The nations include your community, the people you like and don't like, the boss that yelled at you. Yeah, they need Jesus too. In fact, if they're yelling at you, that's probably a sign that, that they, they, they're in a position where they want to hear about Jesus. Things are probably going on. They're a little stressful in their life, and they need to see the glory of God reflecting in you. Something is holding us back. Something owns more of us than Jesus does, and he is jealous for us. And he wants to protect us from the demon gods that we worship as idols. See, the question that Gideon had asked Jesus is like complaining that we're getting wet when we keep walking out from God's umbrella. So as we pick back up in our story, we see the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other people of the east had come together to launch this full-scale attack on Israel. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon to rise up, and Gideon assembles an army. He marches his army up to go advance towards uh, the, the Midianite camp. And then there's an interruption. There's an interruption in the plants. You ever make plans and get interrupted? And all the parents said? All right, cool, right? I got three kids. Life is an interruption, okay? Um, <laughs> so, so you know. There's interruptions. So here Gideon is trying to assemble this, this untrained army to come against these terrorists that are looking to completely annihilate them. And as he assembles this army, the interruption doesn't come from the army. The interruption didn't come from the enemy. The interruption didn't even come from, from internally of his family. God, who sent him on the mission, interrupted the mission. In Judges 7-2, God says to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me saying, my own hand has saved me. I just want to be real with you guys. I'm not super spiritual. I'm not holy. I'm just as messed up as you are. And I, like you, like Gideon, would have thrown a fit. <laughs> Come on, right? Lord, Lord, Look, listen, you know, are you going to micromanage me here? You tell me to get an army, I get a bunch of people, and you're like, there's too many? Have you seen them? Too Can you have too many? Are you kidding me? I didn't think this was enough. You're telling me this is too many? This has got to be some sort of a sick joke. <laughs> but no. <laughs> Gideon, Gideon obeys God. Gideon obeys God even in times where we wouldn't. What, Gide what God was asking Gideon to, uh, to do was to voluntarily become even more outnumbered. God wanted Gideon to let more soldiers go, to be less in number. Why? To become more vulnerable to the enemy. Why? To, to make it so clear to everybody around, there is no possible way Israel is winning this fight. How many of you have been there? Hey, how many of you are, right, are, are there right now? You don't know how you're going to make it through. You have no clue how you're going to be able to share Jesus with the people in your life because you feel like your life's falling apart and you got no shot. <laughs> go, go be a missionary in my community? I'm, dude, do you know what my life is like right now? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe those things are not something God's allowing. Maybe it's something God's ordaining. Maybe he wants us to so heavily recognize we need him for everything. And we're so stubborn and jaded that we're like, Psh, I could take on 
an army of 100,000 by myself. Really? Hello. <whistles> you barely tied your shoes to get here this morning. Uh, you know? He does this on purpose. God was revealing something really powerful to Gideon and powerful to the Midianites and to the world and to us today. And it's that God wants our affection. He wants our worship. He wants all the glory. And he makes sure we're outnumbered so there's no question as to who got us through, as to who saved us, as to who changed us. You know, it's funny. When, when we come to Jesus that first time, we, we get it. Yeah. I, it, without that, without what you, you did for me, I'm spending eternity in hell. I've recognized that. Jesus, I know I've got nothing and I need you. And for some reason, just a few minutes later, we're like, all right, God, I got this on the agenda for you. Uh, what else do you need me to do? Yeah, no, uh, I'll, I'll fit that in. How, how do we go from understanding we bring nothing to the table to suddenly thinking we bring so much more and doing the math for him? God chose Israel and God still chooses today to use weak, broken, sinful, idol-worshiping people like you and I to bring him glory to the nations and to the community in which he has placed us. So let's pick back up in our story in Judges 7, verses 3 through 8. It says, Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone whom I say to you, this one shall go with you. Uh, <clears throat> and anyone of whom I say to you, uh, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. This is crazy. I'm sorry. Like, you know, you, if you grew up in the church and you've heard the story of Gideon and it's kind of like, you know, knowing how this ends, right? It's kind of like the second time you see one of those classic movies like Braveheart or, right? You know, like you're, you're okay the second time because we know how it ends. The first time you're like, cuckoo, 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 right? You don't know what's going down. This story is crazy. And I kind of picture, so, so Gideon, Gideon has this conversation with God and is like, all right, God, you want me to offer anybody who's afraid the opportunity to leave. I got it. And I kind of I picture the scene from Braveheart, right? Where William Wallace is kind of gathering everybody and he's, he's you know, prepping them and they're having this big pep talk and, and now they're like, yeah, we got this, right? And I kind of picture Gideon like getting everybody together. It's like, all right, guys, no problem. One last thing. Before we go, I know you're with me. You, we got this. But before we go, anybody scared? You, that just, you can go home, right? 32,000 people. You're sure maybe just a couple of like, you know, the younger guys who are kind of like, let's go to war. Let's not. You know, <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe they left. No. Like two-thirds are like, oh, you said we can go? All right, deuces. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> hey, hey, Lord, you, did you, did, uh, come on. Now, what's interesting, he, he uses the phrase afraid. Now, look, I never served in the military, but I, I, if, if I can infer a little bit here, I think knowing the odds, knowing who they were going against, knowing these people have terrorized their people and their families for years, every single one of them had to be afraid. 
Every single one of them had to have a degree of fear, right? 22,000 of 32,000 men take him up on his offer and go home. I don't think 10,000 were unafraid and 22,000 were afraid. I would say 32,000 people were afraid, but 10,000 were courageous. I say courage isn't the absence of fear, it's the unwillingness to give in to it. I know you're afraid. I'm afraid. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is the unwillingness to give in to it. So Gideon loses 22,000 men of his army, but at least he has 10,000 courageous ones until God speaks up again and tells Gideon he still has too many men. So if I'm Gideon after now my second or third or fourth fit, right? Gideon obeys God and he brings his 10,000 courageous men who stayed with him down to the water to get a drink. And upon doing so, God tells Gideon all the men who got on their knees to drink should go home. But the 300, only 300 men who lapped up the water are who will go with Gideon to defeat the Midianites. Now this is, this is interesting. Growing up, hearing this story as a kid in church a thousand times at least, I thought that was arbitrary, right? Like, you know, God happened to choose to do it that way. You know, he's done some things I don't understand. He's done a lot of things I don't understand, right? And so that was when I kind of chalked it up. And then in doing research and finding out um, the culture and what was going on, actually was, was pretty interesting. I found out this was, this was pretty significant. In fact, the fact that they referred to them lapping up the water like, like a dog was actually a common phrase of speech in that time period in that region. And what this phrase of speech was referring to was all the wild dogs in that area, when they would go to drink water, they would do it on the move. They wouldn't wouldn't get down on their knees because they were very aware that the water down there was filled with crocodiles. And because of that, they were always lap and go, lap and go. They were aware of their surroundings. They were ready to move. The 9,700 courageous people got on their knees. It's very difficult to avoid a crocodile when you're on your knees. But there was an understanding in that culture at that time that in, in order for you to be aware, you would still, wouldn't get on your knees, would lap up the water like this. So, God's way of separating who would stay and who would go is not necessarily the same way we would, right? We would, we would look for the strongest ones. We would, we would put our guys through like an American Ninja Warrior course, right? We would make sure that, that if they hit that buzzer, you're on my team, right? I know we can, we can handle anything, right? But that's not how God had, had Gideon separate them. He separated the few courageous and the few aware, the courageous and the aware. Where are we at today, integrity? Are we courageous? Are we aware? Are we aware of our surroundings? Are we aware of the traps of the enemy? Are we aware of the idols in our backyard? Are we walking around aimlessly, just distracted by the cares of this world? Are we too busy worrying about things that aren't important and letting our guard down as we take a knee? Are we taking a step back from the mission? This is wartime. This isn't peacetime. Peacetime is when these eyes see the eyes of the God-man who got up there from me. That's peacetime. And let me tell you, that's going to (laughs) rock. I'm really stoked about that day. But until that day comes, we are at war. It is wartime. Now, the war is not against the people around us. It's for them. The war is not against the protesters. The war is not against the police. The war is not against ISIS. It's for them. Oh, sweet irony. 
In Ephesians 6.12, Paul reminds us we aren't warring against the people around us, but we're warring against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Our war is with the enemy of our souls. Our war is with the enemy who looks to capture the souls that God has put us as jars of clay and trusted with the gospel of peace to go, to go, not to be silenced, not to hide in mountains, not to be fearful, not to run away, but to run towards, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to get a little dirty. Let's be so involved that people find it hard to believe that we're church folk because of who we're hanging out with. Let the same accusations they made of Jesus be made of us. Because if somebody feels like they can't walk into this building because it might collapse on them or they'll be judged or, oh, I can't go to a church, we're putting out the wrong message, folks. We're waging war on the wrong people. We pick back up in our story where Gideon and his 300 men are now preparing for the fight. And Gideon guides his men with a war strategy of placing torches and clay pots to hide them and trumpets in hand. Gideon had his men surround the camp of the Midianites at night when they would least suspect an attack. And now whether, whether this was um, God's wisdom... <laughs> given to Gideon for this plan, or if God directly gave it to him, the Bible doesn't comment on that. But either way, what we do see happen is right before they're about to do this, God interrupts Gideon one more time. And he says to him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go sneak into the Midianite camp. And I want you to just listen. Oh, okay. All right. So Gideon goes, sneaks into the, into the camp, and he happens to overhear a conversation between two of the Midianites. They're having a conversation about a dream that one of them had that night. He says, Behold, I dreamed the dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And somehow... His comrade translated this dream as, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. Gideon, and it says, Gideon immediately worshipped. And he went back ready to fight. I, I love this. I love this. Don't miss this. This is huge. Gideon was more scared to go into a fight with 32,000 men than he was with 300. What changed? (laughs) What changed? You gotta be some sort of crazy to be more scared to go fight with 32,000 men behind you than with 300. What changed was he finally saw God went before him. God went before him. God has gone before us. Guys, we're we're terrified to open up our mouths because of what people might think. Meanwhile, God has been sending people, working on that person's heart all week, all month, all year, their whole lives. And it's like, dude, just, just trust me on this. God's like, trust me, just open your mouth. I'm scared. Just do it. Please, no, just do it. <laughs> Jesus loves you. What must I do to be saved? I mean, oh please. And you're like, say what? And we get all shocked and surprised. And then we get excited. And you know who finds out? The pastors, the phone rings. Guess what happened? I told someone about Jesus and they were like, yes. Good. (laughs) This is what we do, right? (laughs) You know? And, And it's so true. God has gone before us. We should be less scared knowing we're outnumbered because God the Holy Spirit is pushing us, is guiding us. We can't do this on our own. We can't even save ourselves. Never mind, go and help others meet Jesus. We got nothing. But we could be mighty men and mighty women of valor simply because God is the one orchestrating the plan. (laughs) 
So the men surrounded the camp, and they smashed the clay pots and blasted the trumpets. And the Midianites and all the other armies began to flee for their lives, and many of them turned their own swords on their own men as they fled from Gideon. Gideon's 300 men did not pick up a sword. Torch, trumpet. Amen. Torch, trumpet. Light. Lord, your word is a light until my path. I will worship you in victory. I don't need to pull the sword out of the sheath. Come on. That, that is everything. That is everything. He has gone before us. God has sent you on a mission, and he will go before you. He has set forth his plan, and when he sends you out, even when you feel outnumbered and outmatched, he's gone before you. He set it up on purpose for you to be outnumbered. He has set it up on purpose for you to be outmatched. It is not an accident. It is not by happenstance. He's not allowing it. He has ordained it because he loves you and wants to be glorified in and through you. And you know what's amazing? Is when he's glorified in and through us, it changes us. It's crazy. He gets the glory. He gets the honor. He did the work. All I literally did was, yes, Lord, I'll do that. My life has changed. Amen. Guys, we're, we're taking a bunch of our teenagers on a mission trip. We're leaving next Sunday before church service starts. So please pray for us, okay? It's gonna be an awesome, awesome time. But you know what we're showing up to do? Yes, Lord. That's it? Yes, Lord. And you know what you're gonna see when they get back? You're gonna see completely different teams than who won. Not because of me. I take zero credit. I've got nothing to do with it. It is simply God the Holy Spirit working through a bunch of teenagers and crazy adults that'll go hang out with teenagers for a week in Vermont, okay, who just said, yes, Lord, and they're going to come back changed. God's calling us out to be courageous. He's calling us out to be aware, not to be docile and lulled to sleep. He has outnumbered us on purpose because the secret ingredient to every battle is trusting God who wants the glory and is unwilling to share it with any others. So we need to go home today. And we need to clean out our backyards. Every single one of us. We need to go home and clean out our backyards. All the idols we've allowed there need to go. And by go, I don't mean we put them in a storage unit. Not even a trash can. I want you to get out that gasoline. I'm just kidding. Don't get in trouble. I don't know what your town code is. All right? <laughs> but <laughs> but they, they, they need to go. They need to die. Don't be fearful. You might be like Gideon at the beginning of the story, hiding and afraid, filled with complaints and excuses. But Jesus called him a mighty man of valor because Jesus sees what he can do through you, not what you are without him. We are outnumbered. God likes it that way. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. Dear God, we thank you so much, Father, for who you are. God, we thank you that you refuse to share your glory with any other. God, we're sorry when we try to share in your glory. God, we're sorry that we dare bow our knee to anybody but you. Lord, we don't mean it. Lord, we don't mean to. We're just foolish sheep. And you know that and you forgive us and you are gracious. So Holy Spirit, guide us. Holy Spirit, put the people you've been working on in our path and light a fire under us and in us so that you might be glorified and your kingdom might expand because of this foolish, idol-worshiping, self-centered fool that's willing to say yes to you. Now we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.